straight out of Scotland, this is the Reluctant Theologian Podcast. I am your host, Dr. R.T. Mullins from the University of Edinburgh. Aseity is one of those words that theologians love to throw around, but what does it mean? Is aseity the same thing as necessary existence? And what are the reasons for thinking that an ase being exists? In today's episode, I sit down with Chad McIntosh to discuss the doctrine of aseity in all its glorious details. We get into the principle of sufficient reason and cosmological arguments for the existence of God. We also chat about the implications of aseity for debates over the Trinity and divine simplicity. Chad gives us some spicy takes on simplicity that I'm sure you won't want to miss. If you've got questions or topics that you want to hear on the show, you can send me a message at rtmullins.com. Well, ready or not, here's Chad and I talking about triune self-existence. Enjoy. So, Chad, thank you so much for being on the show today. So, in addition to being uh, omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent, and so on, many people think that God also has the divine attribute of aseity, which is what I want to talk to you about today. So, you've been thinking about this for some time, and much of your dissertation, which you just successfully defended, is about this topic. So, to kind of start the conversation, could you just tell me a bit about what is this attribute of aseity? Sure. Thanks, Ryan, for having me on. I'm sure more people listen to this than read an obscure dissertation. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I I appreciate it. But to your question, etymologically, aseity is derived from Latin, uh, ase or aseitas, meaning of or by or through itself, as opposed to ab alio, meaning of or by or through another. So I exist ab alio. Uh, I was first produced by my parents. Uh, I need food, functioning organs, the planet, sun, oxygen, water, all these things. It is by or through these things I exist, so to speak. But a being that exists, ah, say, is radically unlike me in this respect. It exists through itself, answering to nothing else for its existence, for its being, which is a pretty impressive attribute when you think about it mm-hmm. in those terms. Yeah. But beyond just this etymological characterization, there really is no basic analytic definition of aseity like there is other divine attributes. For instance, we can start to think more clearly about what it means to be omniscient uh, if we start by saying, well, it means at least that you believe all truths and don't believe any falsehoods and go from there. Mm -hmm. But with aseity, we're more often just shown a thesaurus, it seems. So we're told to be ase is to be self-existent, self-sufficient, independent, underived, unoriginated, uncaused, uh, the ultimate ground, and so on. But it doesn't take a lot of reflection to see that these are by no means synonymous or coextensive terms. So there's a lack of analytic rigor in defining aseity, but that should be enough to get a rough idea of the concept we're getting at. Okay, so you've kind of talked a bit about here, you've got all these different concepts that we typically just associate with aseity, and it seems like, well, okay, maybe they're really not synonymous, like you point out. So let's start with necessary existence, though. Is is aseity the same thing as necessary existence? That's a good question, and no, they're not the same, and it's important to see why. Uh, Something is necessary if, roughly speaking, it cannot not exist. So in possible worlds, semantics... To be necessary is to exist in all possible worlds. Any coherent scenario you can imagine or dream up, or even once you can't, a necessary being will be there. But the key difference is that necessary beings don't have to be ase. Anselm, Aquinas, Leibniz, and so on, they all recognize this. So the number two, for example, might depend on the number one as its predecessor, and the number three depend on the number two, and so on to infinity. Now, some philosophers have even thought that necessary beings can be created, but not an ase being. So the hallmark of aseity is not having to answer to anything outside or beyond oneself for one's being. And this is still a rough characterization in many ways, but it should serve to get us going. Yeah, no, I find this intuitive because you're right. Like I could imagine all sorts of necessary beings, but they might depend on other things. So just just saying like they're synonymous, that just doesn't work. That's right. So, uh, so, the, so yeah, so the next question I guess I have for you then is why should I think that God has the attribute of aseity? Yeah, so there's probably two main reasons. One comes from considerations about what it means to be a perfect being. Anselm 
famously described God as a being none greater than which can be conceived. He is the greatest, most perfect possible being. So just as we think that a perfect being would know everything, would be all-powerful, would be morally impeccable, and so on, intuitively, a perfect being would be one that needn't answer to anything else for its existence. It would be completely metaphysically self-sufficient. It would be ase of itself. Okay. So perfect being considerations, they're going to lead us to think that God is ase. Are there any other reasons for thinking that God is ase? Yeah. So the more powerful reasons to think God is ase would be like cosmological type arguments for the existence of an ase being. So take the following principle of sufficient reason. Everything that exists has an explanation of its existence. Now, the chain of things whose existence is explained by something else is vicious unless reference is ultimately made to something explanatorily outside that chain. Uh, So here an example might help. Mm -hmm. There's an old apocryphal story. Uh, I've heard it attributed to Bertrand Russell. Uh, I've heard it attributed to Max Planck. There's this old story about a professor lecturing about how the gravitational forces of other astronomical bodies explains the Earth, Earth's location in space. Now, in a Q&A, an impatient old lady balked at the idea that the Earth could just be floating there in space. She insisted instead <laughs> that the Earth rests on the shell of a galactic turtle. Right, right. And when the professor asked the lady, well, what's the turtle resting on? She replies, well, it's turtles all the way down. The problem <laughs> yeah. with the lady's theory isn't just that galactic turtles don't exist. The problem is that it's not explanatory. So postulating an infinite number of turtles, one on top of another, doesn't wind up explaining anything. It defers explanation indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Alexander Proust puts it nicely in his book on the principle of sufficient reason. He says, we only accepted the tortoise as explanatory because we thought we were moving close to the ultimate explanation of the earth's failure to fall. But once we learn that we are no longer, we are no closer to any such explanation, we may no longer see the tortoise as explanatory. It makes no difference here how many tortoises we have, be it one, two, three, or infinity. The earth is just as suspended. So in a phrase, it can't be turtles all the way down, and it can't be one thing explaining another all the way down for the same reason. But the only kind of thing outside the chain of things whose explanation is in another is something whose explanation is in itself, an assay being. All right. So that that makes sense to me. Uh, Maybe you can give us like a broad overview of how philosophers thought of Aussadi throughout history. Oh, we could do a whole podcast talking about just this, and I wish we could. There are some real fascinating and neglected gems in the medievals and and early moderns in particular on this. But, uh, well, let me just preface the historical comment with this observation. If you take a closer look at the descriptions of of Aussadi by those who take the Thoris approach, we find some terms that some terms seem to pick out something negative, and other terms are trying to pick out something positive. So the negative side we have independent. God is independent, underived, unoriginated, unconditioned, uncaused, indestructible, and so on. But on the positive side, we see philosophers saying that God is self-existent, self-sufficient, metaphysically absolute the ultimate ground of being, self-caused, self-grounded, and so on. Mm -hmm. So we can think of the group of negative terms converging on what I think of as a negative conceptual core of aseity. So God, unlike everything else, owes his being to nothing beyond external or outside of himself. This is what contemporary analytic philosophers like Bill Craig and Brian Leftow are, are chiefly interested in. But we can't just ignore that other group, which seems to have a more positive conceptual core. So the main idea there is that what we usually appeal to to explain the existence of non-divine things, which would be an external cause or ground, God has that internally or in himself. Something about God's own being is the reason he exists. So this being said, a broad view of the history of reflection on aseity is this. Both the negative and positive aspects are found in the patristics, although somewhat inchoately. Mm -hmm. Aristotelian presuppositions led the medievals to emphasize the negative conceptual core, with perfect being considerations doing most of the work there. But the rationalist presuppositions, like the principle of sufficient reason, 
led the moderns to emphasize the positive conceptual core. So a full orb conceptual analysis of aseity will incorporate both of these aspects, and that's what I'm interested in exploring. Okay, so I think we have a decent handle then on what aseity is. So maybe you could just kind of briefly sketch for us some of the main problems and controversies surrounding aseity as it's currently discussed in the literature. Sure. Most philosophers seem to think the main challenge facing the coherence of aseity comes from realism about abstract objects. Realism is the view that things like numbers, sets, propositions, properties, and so on really exist. And abstract objects are interesting because they're like God in the sense that they're the sort of things that if they exist at all, they exist necessarily. Mm -hmm. They can't exist in one possible world, but not in others. They have a stronger grip on reality than contingent objects do. Yeah. So I guess in my mind, I've never really understood what this problem is supposed to be. And I mean, I've read like, you know, like the five views book on like uh, God and abstract mm -hmm. objects and I've read some of Craig's stuff, but like, I, I'm always just like, what exactly is the problem supposed to be here? Yeah. Well, we don't want to say that abstract objects exist independently of God, lest there be this vast realm of things that exist beyond God's creation and control. God is supposed to be the source of all that exists apart from himself. But it's hard to see how God could be the source of abstract objects, since if they exist, he himself would seem to depend on them. The best example of this that I know of is, is the bootstrapping objection. Mm. If God is the source of abstract objects, he'd be the source of his own properties. But he must already have certain properties to be the source of them, namely the property of being the source of properties. Or take numbers, for example. Was it not true that there was one God prior to God's being the source of the number one? Uh, if so, well, then what, in what sense can God be said to be the source of numbers? And the extant literature on aseity is basically all about this. It's all about mm -hmm. this, this problem and almost nothing else. So you could have various solutions to this problem. One is to identify abstract objects with God's ideas. This is a more traditional solution that has its roots in Augustine and, and Aquinas. And I like this view but it's not as clean of a solution as its defenders sometimes let on. Mm. It's not clear how God's ideas can be multiply instantiated like properties can be. And since we have knowledge of abstract objects, how is it that we have come to have this knowledge of, of God's ideas and, and, and only specific of God's ideas? Uh, it's also unclear whether mm. it really avoids the bootstrapping objection since presumably God's mind is still prior to his ideas. So that's that's one solution. Another more straightforward solution to the problem is to simply deny that there is a problem by denying that there are any abstract objects at all. Mm -hmm. So if abstract objects don't exist, the problem just goes away. And William Lane Craig right. is the most prominent defender of this view. And, and he really has done an impressive job, I think, summarizing the various anti-realist options one might take up in the face of the challenge. So, so let's talk about Craig's book here for a second. So, so you, gave a, you wrote a book review on Craig's book. And in some of what you're currently working on, you argue that the problem posed by abstract objects is just, well, it's, I guess it's like largely peripheral to the deeper challenges to Osseity. Can you just maybe tell us a bit more about that? Right. Abstract objects do pose a puzzle, but the main problem re remains even if abstract objects don't exist. Mm. Christians believe there are dependence relations between the concrete members of the Trinity. So the traditional view is that the Son is begotten of the Father, and the Spirit proceeds either from the Son or both from the Father and the Son. Now, it's clear that the relations of divine begetting and procession are asymmetric dependence relations. Right. In other words, both the Son and the Spirit exist ab alio, not ase. But as divine persons, they too are supposed to have all the divine perfections. And it makes no sense to say that the Father confers aseity on the other persons. That just is not what we mean by aseity. Right, yeah. Uh, and, and, what, and what would it even mean anyway to say that all three persons each exist in their own right, exist independently and underived? I and mean, if you think of how you could express tritheism, I don't think there could be a clearer expression of tritheism, tritheism than that. So right. it's the doctrine of the Trinity, not abstract objects, that poses the real problem for the coherence of aseity. No, I, I find this really intuitive because I've had these debates with uh, people like William Hasker on this, where I'm just like, it seems to mm -hmm. me that aseity, like you're just not going to get it if the f father, uh, you know, is in some kind of asymmetrical dependence relationship with the other divine, divine persons. So yeah, I can see why this is a real problem. So what do you think are some of our options for dealing with this problem? So I think we have a couple options. The first is 
is to offer a deeper philosophical analysis of aseity, one that makes room for inter-Trinitarian dependence relations. Unfortunately, I don't know of anyone doing this. I had the same questions and same discontent when I read Hasker's book as, uh, the, as you did mm-hmm. uh, on this question. Uh, and it's, if, it's as if many Christians, when they philosophize about the attri- attributes of God, they forget about the Trinity. They forget that the Trinity is even a thing. But the Trinity affects the metaphysics of God in basically every way. So they can't, they can't forget about the Trinity when, they, when they're thinking about omniscience, omnipotence, and especially aseity. Now, the other option, which I mention here in sort of an ecumenical spirit, is to embrace the doctrine of divine simplicity. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the view that God is, Aquinas' phrase is, omnino simplex, altogether metaphysically simple. And many theists will go this route. They'll say that uh, if God is absolutely simple, there's no real dependence relations in God. God is independent in the straightforward, prosaic, flat-footed sense that he is not dependent on anything, period. Not even anything like his own concrete parts. So in this way, arguments for an ase being that we considered earlier are really arguments for a simple being. Mm-hmm. If to be dependent on another for one's being is an imperfection, then a perfect being will not be dependent on anything, period. Likewise, only an independent being can bring explanatory closure to the chain of dependent beings. So divine simplicity can be used to to do some work here, but of course it relies on, th- that all depends on whether or not there's independent reason to think God is simple. Right. So I guess let's just look at like, why would we not want to embrace simplicity? Yeah, there are big problems with simplicity, uh, chief among which is known as the problem of modal collapse. I'm not going to try to explain that problem here. You've done excellent work on this, and I'm sure you could articulate it much better than I could. But further, and I know this was this will uh, make my classical theist friends cringe. I just don't see how divine simplicity is compatible with the Trinity. Appealing to simplicity to save aseity is, to me, theologically perverse. Many people don't know this, but the doctrine of divine simplicity actually has its origins in anti-Trinitarian Muslim and Jewish apologists. They found in Aristotle a lot of philosophical ammunition against Christians, uh, which sadly Aquinas inherited through Arabic commentators on Aristotle. So I'm just not willing to follow that route. No, I, that, that makes sense to me because when I when I start reading through like the, the med- medieval thinkers and I see these sort of debates pop up, I'm just like, why would anybody think this would work? Like this is what we've been criticized <laughs> for for years, like centuries. Right. So yeah. So uh, so well, like I guess what are some of the arguments for Nase being uh, you know kind of converging on a simple being though? Let's 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 look at that. Yeah, this does deserve more attention because they, they have some good arguments here, um, but it all hangs on how we understand the terms independent, dependent, and how perfection relates to them. Mm-hmm. And we'll come back to this, I'm sure, but for now, let me just give an argument from Aquinas against divine simplicity. You ready? Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, Aquinas, among others, embraced a principle of sufficient reason that says everything has an explanation, either in itself or in something else. Now, assume God is independent in that flat-footed sense that he's just not dependent on anything, period. So he's absolutely simple. Mm -hmm. Now we can ask, what explains God's existence? Clearly, there are no explanatory resources external to God to explain his existence. Mm -hmm. But just as clearly, there can be no explanatory resources internal to God since there are no real distinctions between anything and an absolutely simple being. There's just nothing in there for a genuine explanatory relation to squeeze between. So it would seem that an independently existing, absolutely simple being just is, and it would have to be just there without explanation. Nothing exists without explanation, though. Uh, That comes from the PSR. Mm -hmm. So if uh, you accept the PSR, you must reject divine simplicity. Okay, so I want to make sure I'm following because that's going to be a very surprising uh, like move for for a lot of people listening. So again, we started with this principle of sufficient reason that is, that most people like Aquinas are going to affirm, and it says everything has an explanation, and that includes God. That's right. But if you make God simple, then you you just lose the explanation entirely. You have no explanation, and so then you're saying, well, then if I'm really going to affirm the principle of sufficient reason then I can't have simplicity because simplicity gives me no explanation. That's exactly right. So it's either simplicity. Okay, right. So so simplicity or the principle of sufficient reason. 
Yep, that's it. Right. Okay. So, all right. So, so tell us then about your preferred solution to this problem. Sure. I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. But it's worth mm-hmm. noting at least that uh, Brian Leftow, he too noted this problem. And contrary to the esteemed Aquinas scholar Norman Krenzman, uh, who mm-hmm. does attribute the PSR to Aquinas, Leftow says, no, for this reason, we can't attribute the PSR to Aquinas because it winds wow, up getting him okay. in all these troubles, yes. which I think is interesting. Yeah, <laughs> that is, that is. Okay. So, okay. So this, so the, we've got a very interesting kind of debate going on here now. So again, so let's see. Yeah. So let's, what is your solution to this problem? Yeah. So if, so if simplicity isn't an option, we need a richer concept of aseity and the attending concepts of dependence and independence and how perfection relates to those. So first, let's agree that an ase being cannot depend on anything outside or beyond or external to itself. Mm-hmm. Now, this leaves open the possibility that it might depend on something internal to itself. And here, I think the obvious candidate is its parts. And by part, I just mean what constitutes something's most salient, objective, ontological structure. Mm-hmm. Now, I clarify this because some Thomists sometimes have a very crass understanding of muriology, where if something has parts, it's physical, it could fall apart. Right. Uh, But come on, let's get serious. Non-physical things can have parts and have their parts essentially. Mm -hmm. Just take the set of natural numbers, for example. Right. Uh, Or or closer to home, we might think that souls have parts like Plato did. And in the case of the triune God, it would be the divine persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Right. Okay. So now suppose... Instead of thinking the persons are arranged in a hierarchy of dependence, we see them as symmetrically dependent on each other. No person is asymmetrically dependent on another, and no one person has ontological supremacy by being another source. Equality in this context, uh, I think, is a good value, right? Mm -hmm. So classical theists, even classical theists should agree, since they argue for simplicity on the grounds that if God has parts, he would depend on them, but not vice versa. And they always they always add that qualifier, but not, not mm-hmm. vice versa, which I think is interesting. But if asymmetric dependence is the problem, uh, why would it not be a problem in the case of the son depending on the father, but not vice versa? Mm, I see. Okay. Saying the persons are equally in- interdependent avoids this problem. Uh, and this is always, this is what the doctrine of perichoresis has always had us imagine. Right. Okay. So again, I want to make sure I'm following the move here. So if if asymmetric in, like a uh, dependence, if that's a problem between uh, like aseity and parts in general, and well, if you say that, you admit that, then you have to admit it in the case of the Trinity as well. That's and so exactly you're saying, right. right. Okay, good. And so you're saying, well, then let's get rid of the asymmetrical uh, dependency here. Let's make it just completely symmetrical. At least get rid of asymmetric dependence on anything external to or beyond or outside of oneself. Right. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah. Okay, so then let's let's get to this next question here. So symmetric dependence, I guess like it might not be incompatible with perfection, but maybe there might be some other like philosophical uh, problems here. So are, are there any like philosophical difficulties with symmetric dependence? Like maybe it's like viciously circular? Yeah, this is a good point and this gets to the heart of what I argue in my dissertation. So hmm. bear with me for a bit here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might get a little technical. Sure. I agree that symmetric or mutual dependence, as commonly understood, is viciously circular. And a paradigm example of this would be time travel cases. Oh, right. Suppose I build a time machine, but only because I had the plans delivered to me by my future self who built a time machine. The temporal order here is not really the problem. The problem is having one state of affairs, A, existing only because another, B, which exists only because of A. You can just see that that's obviously viciously circular. Right. David Armstrong's ontology is another example. He wanted to maintain both that states of affairs depend for their existence on their constituents, but also that constituents depend for their existence on states of affairs. And his view has rightly been blasted as viciously circular. And there's a similar problem with Michael McKenna's theory of moral responsibility, according to which being responsible depends on being held responsible And holding someone responsible depends on them being responsible. But wait, which comes first, being or holding responsible? Uh, The general problem is that if B exists only because of A, then A is prior to B. That seems true. (laughs) But then how could A exist only because of B? Since then, B would be prior to A. And clearly, they can't be prior to each other. That's metaphysically impossible. Right, yeah. And this causes problems even for the most plausible 
cases of mutual dependence. So you might think that the north and south poles of a magnet depend on each other. Or there's Kit Fine's example of uh, what he calls reciprocal essences, where the essence of Sherlock Holmes depends on being admired by Watson, and the essence of Watson depends on admiring Holmes. And as, it, as innocent as these examples seem, they're metaphysically impossible if in each case, the two terms owe their existence only to each other, since then they'd be prior to each other. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's the general problem, the setup of, of difficulties with vicious circularity facing cases of mutual dependence. Right. And this is the key point going from here. Not all cases of mutual dependence should be understood this way, namely as merely binary, where all we have is the chicken and the egg uh, and the question of which came first. In the magnet example, the North and South Poles do depend on each other, but not just each other. They also depend on a third thing, namely a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the essences of Holmes and Watson do depend on each other, but not only each other. They also depend on other things in the Arthur Doyle series. And we can say the same thing about some of the other examples. Being and holding responsible do depend on each other, but they also depend on a community of moral agents. Now, it's this introduction of a teratium quid, a third thing, that is key to non-vicious mutual dependence in general. Other examples of mutual dependence explicitly exhibit this sort of tripartite structure, such as the relations between mass, density, and volume, hylomorphic compounds of matter form and that which conjoins them, and certain subatomic particles such as protons and neutrons, which are made up of quark triplets. So there don't have to be just three, to be sure. We have an example in mathematical structuralism, according to which numbers are are like interdependent nodes in an infinite structure. Mm -hmm. So there don't have to just be three, but the lesson is clear. There can be non-vicious mutual dependence only if you have a minimum of three terms, each dependent on each other in the right way. Okay, so I think I understand where you're going here, but why don't you just kind of bring it home for me? Right. The persons of the Trinity are related to each other in this way. Not only does this seem compatible with perfection, as pointed out earlier, it's also compatible with the principle of sufficient reason. Each person of the Trinity is explained by the other two. Problem solved. The triune God is explained by the divine persons who explain each other. Now, actually, we can take this a step further and argue that it's demanded by the PSR. Mm. So the PSR, again, is that everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in itself or in something else. The chain of beings explained by something else needs to refer to a being whose explanation is in itself, or else we have a beings all the way down scenario. Right. And we don't want the turtles all the way down. Right. We don't want turtles and we don't want beings explained by each other all the way down. So there exists a being whose explanation is in itself. That's our argument for aseity. Well, how does that work exactly? Uh, What does it mean? How does it work to have an explanation in itself? Now we have something to say about that. Recall that a simple being having no internal structure can have no internal explanation. Mm -hmm. But as we've seen, having only two terms in the structure would be viciously circular. Right. So minimally necessary for a complete internal explanation is having that tripartite structure where each term is explained by the other two. This also eliminates seeing God as the Father as the ultimate source of the Son and Spirit, Mm -hmm. since then he explains them, but nothing explains him. Right. But if they all mutually depend on each other, as I've imagined, nothing goes unexplained. So we get an argument from the PSR for an Asse being that must have three parts. So, so right. So I've got. So I have to get rid of the source account of the Trinity. So where I have to. So I have to get rid of the claim the Father is the source of the Trinity. But I get to actually preserve the doctrine of the Trinity, the rest of the attrib- aspects of the Trinity, and I can keep the PSR. And I've got Asseity for all three persons. So I can really say they they have the same essence. They, they're homoousius. Like that's. Uh, that seems pretty great to me. Um, but uh, there's some other questions that might kind of come up here at this point. So why why not more than three like parts or terms? Like why not more than just like, you know, the, just a tripart being here? Yep. And does this tripart being have to be God? Couldn't it be something else? Yeah, that's, that's the next question. Mm-hmm. Well, we're familiar with Occam's razor. Don't multiply mm-hmm. entities beyond necessity. And Jonathan Schaffer, philosopher, has recently proposed his own parsimony principle, what he calls the laser don't multiply fundamental entities beyond necessity. Okay, fine, let's agree. There's only one fundamental being. For Schaffer, it's the cosmos, which grounds its many, 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 many parts. But now I have a parsimony principle of my own to recommend. Let's call it Chad's eraser. Okay. (laughs) Don't multiply parts of a fundamental entity beyond necessity. Since all we need on my view is a being with three parts, 
we should just go ahead and erase all the rest. But why think such a being, this tripartite being, is God? Well, for one thing, the PSR also gives us reason to think the being which ultimately explains all contingent reality is necessary. So there's that. So we have a necessary being who has its explanation in itself. And apart from parsimony principles, it would be very implausible to see like the cosmos or subatomic particles as necessarily existent. Right. But there's also what I'll call the argument from very suspicious metaphysical coincidence. It just so happens that the world's most dominant religion has it that there is only one God who is necessary, exists I'll say, and wouldn't you know it, he's also triune. Sure. So what are the odds? <laughs> okay, so so you've argued that they've got to have like a certain kind of dependence and that this is going to be compatible with uh, perfection on Sadie. But it's it's what you're you're left with that's like it's really the picture here of of, a, of an Osei being. Like I mean like there's a sense in which I guess everything on your proposal, including the persons of the Trinity, is going to be explained by another. Is this really true to the spirit of Osei? Like, because I kind of felt like it's you know it's supposed to be this like property of not being explained by another. Yeah, you could argue that, and this is the the point of tension that I think might be there on my model. But like I said up front, there is no orthodox understanding of Osei. There's mm -hmm. a lot of room for conceptual analysis here, and and what I've offered is an analysis of, analysis of what it could mean for something to have its explanation in itself, uh, of what it means to be ontologically self sufficient that doesn't involve all these other problems, and no other being that exists is like this. Now, as for perfection, look, intuitions about perfection should be informed by a plausible axiological framework. Right. Uh, otherwise, one man's intuition is just as good as another's. And one venerable way of thinking about value here, and this goes all the way back to Plato, is in terms of what's, what's sometimes called organic unity, where value supervenes on unity and diversity. In fact, uh, the English word good stems from an Indo-European root, meaning to unite, join, fit together, and so on. Okay, so I think I'm following along here, but could you maybe give me an example to, to help out? Of course, yeah. A good painting is one that unites a diversity of form, textures, colors, tones, and so forth into a beautiful image. A musical symphony unifies across time a diversity of sounds into a pleasing score. A novel will tie together various themes, plots, and characters into a meaningful narrative. Theories that unify a diversity of phenomena in their explanations, such as what I've tried to do here, have a high degree of theoretical value. They're often described as elegant and beautiful, such as also the value of knowledge and understanding. We don't just want beliefs that happen to be true. We value knowledge, where justification or warrant brings truth into a proper unity. Now, Robert Nozick, who's written extensively about this, has made the suggestion that perhaps the most valuable organic unity of all is found in a person, since in persons we see an I, like this self-consciousness, this I, that attends all of his other experiences and thoughts. So this I unifies this incredibly rich, diverse mental life of a being. So uh, a first, so a being that has a first-person perspective that unites all of his experiences and thoughts in this especially tight, intimate way is thought to be extremely valuable. But if that's true, obviously, then a tri-personal being would be of greater value still. Right. Okay. So that makes sense to me. But the thing is, like, so I've got if if persons are of such great value here, and then you're like, well, okay, well, I've got a tri-personal being. That's pretty awesome. Well, but what about like just adding like one more person, one more person to the to the divine <laughs> life? Because then I keep getting uh -huh. more and more value. So why not like four divine people? Why not five? Like you know, yeah. why just this tri-personal being? Yeah. Uh, why not go full pan panentheist, where all minds exactly. are sub minds of one consciousness? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this it seems is like actually, I'm adding more value. Yeah. Yeah. And this is John Leslie's view, actually, and and mm -hmm. obviously I don't want to go that far. But the question, so the question of what constitutes maximal value or what would be absolutely perfect in this framework is an interesting one. But maybe there's a principled threshold beyond which no greater value is possible. And and in here I think of Richard of St. Victor's argument, recently defended by Richard Swinburne, where a familial bond between three persons is the highest kind of interpersonal value. Beyond that, there's no new kind of value that can be added. But the overall point is, if we tether our intuitions about value, and along with them perfection, to an axiological framework like this, only a certain kind of complex being, one that's an organic unity, can have value. A simple being, by contrast, 
surely isn't an organic unity and so would lack mm-hmm. value altogether. But back to your original question now about the spirit of aseity, if someone wants to insist that only a simple being can be ase, I'm ready to just say fine. I've argued that that comes at the cost of the principle of sufficient reason, seeing God as a trinity, and now at the cost of seeing God as having any value at all. So although I think the picture I've painted is compatible with the spirit of aseity, if you still prefer I call it something else, fine, perhaps a cute alternative term would be try sayity. Okay. Well, Chad, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. And there you have it. Another episode of the Reluctant Theologian Podcast. Stay tuned for episodes on God, emotion, and so much more.